Hello and welcome. I'm Ruben Mesa. I'm the director of the Mays Cancer Center. And it's a great pleasure to, to be with you here today with uh, several of our key leaders, faculty, and staff to address uh, the COVID crisis, what that means for us in general, as well as what that very specifically means as it relates to, to cancer patients, both at the Mays Cancer Center throughout San Antonio and South Texas. So on today's webinar, I'm joined by individuals, some of you whom you've met, others not. Uh, so Daruka Mahadevan, who you met uh, earlier this year, who's our Chief of Hematology and Medical Oncology. Dr. Mark Bonin, who you met in the fall, who is our Chair of Radiation Oncology. Uh, Dr. Jan Patterson, a guest, but a highly valued one. She is an expert in infectious disease, board certified infectious disease specialist and a professor of medicine. She's been playing a central role in the response by UT Health to this crisis, as well as helping to coordinate the city and regional efforts. She brings direct experience from the SARS outbreak in Toronto in 2003. In addition to Dr. Jeremy Viles, who's been doing a superlative job leading our cancer operations and cancer nursing during this crisis. So first, let's kick it off with Dr. Patterson to really share with us a bit uh, how this evolved. Why is this such a difficult problem? What does the near-term future look like? Dr. Patterson. Thank you, Dr. Mesa. So I'll just uh, talk a little bit about uh, where we are right now with COVID and how we got there. Uh, next slide. So this uh, little virus that looks uh, somewhat like a crown, if you use your imagination, uh, has now spread throughout the world with the U.S. leading uh, the world in the number of cases. So we'll look at how we got there next. Um, the, in November, December, uh, China was having some pneumonias of unknown etiology. These started in Wuhan City, the Hubei province, and appear to be associated with a uh, wild animal uh, market there. Uh, the market was really cleaned up before any uh, in-depth investigation could be done, but it's thought that probably uh, an animal coronavirus uh, jumped from animals to humans in this setting, and this is likely what started the outbreak. Next. And here you see uh, just from a few days ago, the Johns Hopkins uh, dashboard, which is updated in real time uh, for the COVID cases uh, throughout the world. Now two and a half million cases. Um, as I mentioned, the US is leading uh, the world in the number of cases. And now eight countries have more cases than China, even though that's such a populous country, they had 83,000 cases. And now eight countries have many more. Um, 170,000 deaths, uh, and Italy uh, leading uh, the um, countries in terms of numbers of deaths. And I think it's interesting to note that um, as far as testing done in the U.S., the number there on the right in blue, uh, around 4 million uh, um, tests in the U.S., even though we have 300 million people in the U.S., and if you look further down, Texas has around 190 tests done, even though we have 30 million people. So we have a ways to go in terms of catching up with testing. Next. Well, just what is coronavirus? We've known about coronaviruses for decades now, uh, and there are four variants of coronavirus that have been circulating for years that cause the common cold. And then in 2003, um, the first uh, known serious coronavirus infection, SARS 2003, which was also a pandemic, also started in China, um, but didn't infect the Western world that much. Uh, it infected Canada and Toronto in particular, where uh, there was very problematic spread in hospitals. And that's when I was involved uh, in working for about three weeks in a SARS-affected hospital up there. Um, the next serious coronavirus that we encountered was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus, or MERS, which emerged in the Middle East and was associated with contact with camels. Um, that 
a virus that kind of has come and gone. Uh, it still comes and goes uh, very intermittently. Uh, not a lot of transmission from person to person as we'll look at. And then finally, the thing we've had to deal with this year, which is the SARS uh, CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19. Next. So let's just look at these three serious coronaviruses and compare them. Uh, as I mentioned, the SARS-1 virus started in Guangdong, China. Um, the original reservoir was thought to be bats. Bats, it turns out, can carry a lot of viruses, including coronaviruses. Uh, and it was thought to transmit the virus to civets, which is a mongoose-type animal that is uh, uh, eaten over there frequently, and the original cases started amongst uh, people who worked in restaurants that served uh, these uh, dishes that had civets. Um, the MERS virus started in Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Again, the original reservoir bats who uh, transmitted it to camels and then from camels to humans. Um, and finally, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, which as we talked about, it originated in Wuhan, again, originated originally in horseshoe bats. And we think that the intermediate vector in this case was probably pangolins. Those are a, uh, an anteater, small anteater type an animal covered with scales. They're highly trafficked uh, for their scales. Uh, we don't know for sure if they were in that animal market, but it's thought that, that they probably were. Um, the incubation period for these three is about the same, around 2 to 14 days. The reproductive number, or R0, which is how, how many uh, people can one person transmit this to, uh, for SARS-1 was thought to be 2 to 3. For MERS, less than 1, not very transmissible from person to person. And SARS-CoV-2, uh, we think it's at least 2 to 3, and in some situations, much higher than that. Um, for as far as asymptomatic transmission, uh, it didn't seem to happen with SARS-1, but can happen with MERS. And we know now, uh, we weren't sure at first, but there's some good data now to show that SARS-CoV-2 um, does have asymptomatic transmission. As far as healthcare transmission, that was a major problem with SARS-1 and also has been with MERS. With SARS-CoV-2, we have seen some healthcare transmission cases, but that hasn't been the predominant uh, problem. It's been more the community transmission has been the predominant mode of transmission with this virus. Uh, case fatality rate is higher with SARS-1, around 10%, and with MERS, 35%. Um, with SARS-CoV-2, we don't know exactly yet because we don't know the extent of infection. Uh, we just know about the cases that have been tested. We think it ranges from less than one to around two and a half percent and is higher in hospitalized patients. Next. So this is just looking a little bit more at that concept of R0, the average number of secondary cases that one person can transmit to. We think it's in the range of three for SARS-CoV-2, um, but as people are physically distancing, that number goes down as less people are available to transmit to. SARS, we thought, was in the range of two to three. Seasonal influenza, which we see every year, we think is in the range of one to two persons. Uh, the 1918 pandemic was around two. And then measles, uh, which is a very highly contagious infectious disease, compare that at around four. Next. Um, as we're talking about case fatality rate, I think it's also helpful to look at influenza pandemic mortality and compare the different influenza pandemics, the ones that we have data from uh, over the past century. Um, the, uh, the earliest one that we really have record of is the 1918-1919 pandemic. It's often called the Spanish flu, uh, but that's really a misnomer because it started in the U.S. and we took it over to Europe at the beginning of World War I, uh, but it got a lot more press in Spain, um, and so it got named the Spanish flu. Um, and it caused around 675,000 deaths in the UA U.S., we think that the case fatality rate was around 2% and was increased in young adults. Now, uh, the next most recent pandemic was in the 2009 
time frame, the H1N1 uh, pandemic that we had that year, um, causing around 150 to 600,000 deaths globally. And the case fatality rate, however, was less than 1%. And that's more like what we see with seasonal flu. And in fact, uh, this year we've seen uh, around 20 to 30,000 uh, deaths from influenza. Um, and, and each year we see in the range of 20 to 40,000 deaths from influenza. But typically the case fatality rate is less than 1%. Uh, next. So the incubation period, as I mentioned, is in the range of two to 14 days uh, with a median or average of about six days. Um, and this has been typical uh, for the other coronaviruses. Next. Um, we also know that the age distribution that is uh, the, the ages at which the disease is most likely to occur is from 30 to 79 years. Um, and the, um, the severity of that illness can vary based on age, but in terms of the cases themselves, they're most likely to occur in that adult uh, age group. Next. And we also know that 80% of cases are mild and 20% of cases are more severe or critical. And these critical, uh, some of the uh, severe cases, many of them are admitted to hospital and certainly the critical ones are, and many of them are in our uh, intensive care units. Now, it, there could be the ratio, if we really knew the extent of infection, which we may not due to the testing issue, it could be that there's many more mild cases that we don't even know about. Next. And then, as I mentioned, the case fatality rate does vary by age uh, with an overall anywhere from the range of one to three percent. But in the 70 to 79 year old age group, eight uh, percent and over 80, uh, around 15 percent. And in those critical cases that end up in the ICU and intubated can be as high as 50 percent. And of course, this difference by uh, age is why we're seeing such a problem in the nursing homes throughout the country. Next. Now, the best test that we have so far is the nasopharyngeal swab and detection of the viral RNA. So this is not actually a culture. We're just detecting RNA fragments of virus. Uh, and the swab is placed through the nose to the back of the uh, nose into the pharynx. Um, and then that swab is placed in the viral media and submitted to the lab for viral detection. Next. So as far as treatment, it's primarily supportive care and these patients require oxygen. Uh, we're, we've also found that they're prone to uh, clotting and so many of them have to be anticoagulated. Um, hydroxychloroquine uh, got a lot of attention early on. Uh, this is Plaquenil, it's um, used for uh, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the evidence has not been very convincing so far. Uh, there, ha there is continuing uh, to a continuing building of experience with this, but I would say we're a little less likely to use hydroxychloroquine than we were early on because uh, it hasn't looked as promising. There is an antiviral remdesivir that was originally developed for uh, HIV disease, um, and it does it is showing some promise in the um, expanded use protocols. There are clinical trials ongoing um, compared with placebo, so we can really know. Uh, whether it makes a difference. And then convalescent plasma, plasma that's been donated from previously infected patients, and there's clinical trials ongoing with that as well. Next. So here's where um, we've been doing some research. Um, with the clinical trials we have, we're one of 75 sites here for the NIH adaptive uh, trial with remdesivir compared to placebo. Um, and we've enrolled about uh, 20 patients on that trial. Um, there, we've also been using the convalescent plasma for some patients. Uh, there is a pending trial that we may participate in on using hydroxychloroquine as prophylaxis for healthcare workers to see if it decreases their risk of infection. And at our center, there's also been research ongoing with personal protective equipment, a textile filter mask, and uh, a homegrown uh, N95 mask 
that's actually was actually FDA approved for our use here. And this has been in collaboration with UHS and Southwest Research Institute. Um, some of our anesthesia faculty have developed a plastic dome enclosure to uh, better protect uh, anesthesia personnel. And there's also basic and translational research going on here looking at the epitopes on the virus that would be effective for a vaccine, uh, looking at uh, the genetics evaluation of who's at risk and immune responses, as well as registry, patient registries for clinical responses and research. Next. So what we've been using for release from isolation uh, and, and uh, most patients are, um, are, are at home instead of in the hospital. Um, and we've been using the CDC, what's called non-testing criteria so that at least seven days have passed since the first symptoms appeared and at least three days have passed since uh, recovery from symptoms, including fever without the use of fever reducing medications. Next. And what we've been trying to do, of course, uh, in, in the public health uh, venue is to flatten the curve. So instead of that sharp curve like Wuhan had, where they overwhelmed their resources in the hospitals, um, trying to flatten the curve so we don't have all the cases at once. And the physical distancing that's that's been happening here in San Antonio has been effective in doing that. Next. So what can we do for prevention? Um, staying home at this time, uh, and, and that means only with household members. It's a difficult consult concept for some. Uh, some people, oh, well, I just had my neighbor over or just my grandchild or my nephew, uh, but that's really not the idea. It's only your household members. And then physical distancing if you must leave the house. Uh, trying to stay at least six feet away from others, and that's because we think these respiratory droplets only travel three to six feet. I like the term physical distancing because I think it's important for us to keep our social connections virtually, um, which we're trying to do. And then cleaning hands often, either with hand washing, uh, making a good lather and washing for at least 20 seconds, or using hand sanitizer. Avoiding touching your face and then wiping down and dis disinfecting frequently touched objects and surfaces daily. Next. What else can we do? Well, we don't often think about nutrition as something uh, to benefit our immunity, but actually it's very important. We know that it's linked to risk and severity of infection and that poorly nourished people are at greater risk of bacterial and viral infections. We also know that the COVID clinical course is more severe among those with nutrition related diseases, uh, for instance, uh, diabetes and obesity. And while we tend to think of these as overnourished people, it's actually they have uh, more calories than needed, but they don't always have the nutrients that they need. Uh, and a healthy diet includes healthy carbs, uh, proteins and healthy fats such as uh, oily fish, olive oil, and so forth, as well as essential minerals and vitamins. It turns out that zinc is a very important mineral in our immune system, and sometimes we don't get enough zinc. Um, vitamin C and vitamin D are also very important for our innate immune system. Next. It's also important to get adequate sleep. It turns out that less sleep increases our risk of infection. Um, uh, and studies have shown, for instance, that less than five hours versus seven hours increases the risk of rhinovirus cold infections. And sleep also uh, increases our CXCL9 levels. That's a monokine cytokine that increases uh, inflammation uh, in the body. We also know that adequate sleep ensures melatonin secretion, and melatonin is also very important as an anti-inflammatory and antioxidant in our systems. Next. And finally, alleviating stress. We know that stress is not good for our immune system. It's very inflammatory and uh, is, is really very poor for our immune system. Things like going outdoors, there's evidence that being out in green space, even if it's in the city, uh, can lower our blood pressure and enhance our immune system. Physical activity, uh, we know is good for our immune system as well. Uh, meditation, social connections, and verbal com communication are all things that lower our stress level. And finally, journaling uh, can be very helpful, just writing out our frustrations and disappointment, and also helping us practice gratitude. All of these things 
are shown to alleviate stress, which benefits our immune system. So that's it from the ID uh, standpoint, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Mesa. Well, Jan, that was a wonderful overview. Really grateful for sharing all your experience. Sure, many of you uh, on the call have some questions for Dr. Patterson. Please be uh, entering those in. You can enter those in at, at any time using the app under the, the question button. So we're going to pivot from there and touch base about what this means in cancer uh, and how we're trying to move forward with our mission during this time. We've set a goal at the beginning of this so that the cancer patients of San Antonio and South Texas could continue to receive the care that they need and do so safely, safely for them, for uh, as well as our faculty and our staff. Now, why cancer is a concern is that it was noted very early on in the course of this pandemic in both China and then in, in Europe, that cancer patients were at greater risk of both developing the infection and then a greater risk of having the severe phase that could make it life threatening. Now, cancer patients themselves are a very heterogeneous group of individuals. They might be young, they might be older, they might have no other medical problems other than cancer, they might have had many other medical problems. Uh, the therapies that they have received might have been recent or they might have been distant. They might be therapies that significantly suppress the immune system or to a much lesser degree. So a very mixed group of individuals indeed. First, we'll ask Dr. Viles, our chief nursing officer, to discuss a little bit how we're operating during this period. Dr. Viles. Thank you, Dr. Massa. Um, first, I want to highlight that, uh, as Dr. Massa mentioned, that the one of the most important parts in, in still maintaining the ability to care for our patients and our community and ensure that they're, they're getting their life-sustaining uh, cancer treatments is we have to protect the, those that are working at the institution and those that are visiting the institution. So one of the one of the first things that we have done, which has been a, a little bit of a challenge, was to implement screening guidelines and, and reducing the flow of traffic into our building. So I, I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, but I we have here listed on the slide some of the the changing criteria and things that we screen for for everyone who comes into our building. So we screen our physicians, our patients, and any visitors or anyone, uh, family member who is coming into our building. And even though some of these symptoms have changed uh, throughout the progression of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we're screening for things like fever, cough, shortness of breath, uh, feeling tired or malaise, sore throat. But some of the, the signs and symptoms have changed over the period, such as uh, loss of taste or smell, which was really something that came a little bit later on in this pandemic. So we're asking all of these questions to everyone who enters the building, including our employees every day. And it, that's really been helpful in maintaining a safe environment for our cancer center. Next slide, please. So some of the other things that we've done to really ensure that, that we have we maintain physical distancing, as Dr. Patterson mentioned, and really uh, we've tried to isolate our workflows for patients and visitors to the institution. So during that screening process that I just mentioned, if we have someone who does have those symptoms, we have a designated elevator and a designated clinical area that's used for nothing at this time other than uh, moving those uh, individuals who do screen positives so that they can get the proper testing that they need, whether that's the actual COVID-19 test or additional blood work or uh, testing to help uh, ensure a proper diagnosis. So we've, we've implemented these pieces to ensure that we continue to offer all of those uh, cancer treatments that are necessary for our patients. So we continue to offer chemotherapy, and radiation therapy and clinic visits in person for those patients in greatest need. 
and uh, Dr. Bonin will talk more about radiation here in a few minutes. We, some of the other interventions that we've done is we have highly limited the number of individuals in our clinics. So we've we've um, had all of our volunteer programs suspended in edu educational classes. We've moved to either a virtual setting or delayed at this time. We've also split our workforce so that we have designated individuals that are here at the cancer center for taking care of patients and then any of those clinical support areas we've actually moved off campus. So our, our call schedulers, uh, call screeners, and some of our um, support personnel have been working from home to help us continue our mission. We've also increased our cleaning of all of the common areas within our organization and making additional passes each shift through uh, touching those high touch areas like doorknobs or elevator buttons and any common area where, where folks uh, tend to have a lot of contact. So those are just some of the items that we've done specifically within our clinics and I will turn it back to Dr. Messa. Well, great. Well, as you can see, Dr. Viles and the entire team has been have been working uh, significantly to try to continue to provide the crucial care that we provide uh, in a way that is safe. Indeed, during this time, we've been caring uh, not only for our patients, but for many other patients from our region that have had care elsewhere, including with our partners at MD Anderson in Houston, who needed to receive that care with us. And we've been honored to be able to step in to, to fill that need, both patients receiving standard therapies, as well as those on clinical trials. In addition to this, Jeannie Paradise and our wonderful team of the Patient and Family Services have been working uh, tirelessly. They've been working with our community partners that have been both very generous and involved in a virtual way, as well as financially, the American Cancer Society, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the San Antonio Food Bank, and ThriveWell. Uh, additionally, we've been trying to support patient psychological needs as best we can, given the current limitations. And psychology at UT Health uh, very rapidly pivoted to televideo visits, and that has been uh, helpful. Additionally, social services continue on in a virtual way, but key for the individuals needing those resources for care. Now, one area that is crucial and one area that there's been tremendous innovation is in the delivery of radiation therapy. Indeed, by its nature, it's something that must be done on site. It takes quite a team, as Dr. Bonham will describe, to deliver that care safely and effectively. Uh, and they've really been leading the effort with some innovations to try to do so in the safest way possible. Dr. Bonham. Thank you, Dr. Mesa. So um, it's a pleasure today to uh, to be able to share with you some of the measures that we've taken here in the Radiation Center at Mays Cancer Center to ensure our ability to continue uh, to provide high quality care to our patients. So um, as uh, Dr. Mesa pointed out, our primary goal, because we knew that cancer wasn't going to social distance like the rest of us, we knew that we had to be able to continue to provide uh, care and support to our to both our current patients and any future patients within the community that might need our services. So uh, as you may or may not know, radiation requires a large team of very diverse individuals uh, to take a patient from the beginning of their care to the very end. And so the primary uh, uh, challenge to us at the time was to figure out a way to protect ourselves from our own staff. Uh, and what I mean by that is, is that if we have a room full of a specific type of employee called, say, a dosimetrist, we had to figure out a way that they wouldn't all be in the same room. So if one of them became ill, then the others would not have that same issue. And so we immediately divided our entire staff into three distinct teams, each team capable of providing a start to finish course of radiation uh, independently of the other two teams. We then uh, uh, distanced these teams from each other physically. So uh, any given team on any given day, only a single team is in the building uh, and the other two teams are working from home. Uh, so by limiting uh, physical interaction uh, completely actually, 
we're able to uh, ensure our ability to continue caring for our patients. So um, this, this is reducing uh, physical interaction uh, with our entire staff. Uh, so in order to do that, we had to create a robust work from home environment. Uh, and what's fascinating is, is that we're actually finding this to be extremely effective. Uh, and to the point that many are wondering uh, if we shouldn't stay with the uh, the way that we're interacting uh, amongst the teams uh, once the COVID risk is is declined, uh, and then further, as uh, Dr. Viles uh, uh, indicated, uh, we're following all the things, screening at the front door, all the things that he mentioned as well that are uh, universal to the entire cancer center. So, as you all know, um, multidisciplinary care is a hallmark of oncology care. And that means that you need your surgeon and your medical oncologist and your radiation oncologist all to be able to talk together. Additionally, these different disciplines within radiation need to be able to work together uh, to come out with the best uh, plan of treatment uh, and outcome for our patients. And so we created a very robust Microsoft Teams. Uh, it's just a teleconferencing uh, system uh, that, that allows us to uh, maintain normal communications the same way we did uh, before COVID, but with a technological spin. Um, the next uh, concern that we had once we had secured uh, our teams uh, and ensured that they wouldn't all uh, be lost uh, if somebody became ill, uh, we decided we, we really needed to focus on reducing the risk of transmission between our patients. So the primary uh, method uh, for, uh, for doing this uh, was to decrease foot traffic through the clinic. Um, unlike, uh, you know, a regular uh, primary care clinic, um, we can't treat patients through telemedicine. So our, our patients that are on treatment have to continue to present physically to our facility. So we established what's called a drive up virtual waiting room. So in the old days, a patient would pull into the parking lot park, walk into the to the waiting area, uh, register with the receptionist, wait in the waiting area for their appointment and then go back once the therapists were ready. Uh, nowadays, uh, they text or phone the uh, therapists that actually deliver the treatments. Uh, and when the therapists are ready to deliver that patient's treatment, uh, the patient's still sitting in their car. They just let them know when they pull into the parking lot. So once the therapist is ready for them, they text them and say, hey, we're ready. And only then will the patient leave their car and go straight to the treatment area receive their treatment, and then go straight back to their car. This eliminates the, the, uh, inter, the physical interactions between our patients. Um, and also, you know, the other thing we were worried about is, is that, you know, there certainly could be patients with COVID or at risk for COVID, high risk for COVID, uh, that we might have to treat. We can't stop treating people with radiation. If we do, it can be very detrimental. For that reason, we created a sequestered treatment protocol for our COVID positive or COVID risk patients. And essentially this entails us treating those patients at the end of the day. Uh, the, of course, the staff wears full protective gear and then the, the room and the machine where the patient is treated undergo a very aggressive uh, cleaning process uh, that, um, that, uh, that eliminates the possibility of, um, of COVID being transmitted through the machine or the treatment room. The room then will have to sit for four hours vacant without being used prior to the next patient. Um, the, uh, the last thing is, you know, one of the challenges that I'm sure you're all uh, experiencing as well is, um, is, is, you know, what Dr. Patterson alluded to, which is that we don't want to social distance, we just want to physically distance. And of course, when you lead a team, this can be a real challenge. So, We've started to try uh, using uh, technology uh, to try to maintain um, a connectedness and cohesiveness amongst the staff. So as you can imagine, we're having uh, a lot of uh, a lot more meetings uh, and, and really uh, some of these would be less characterized as meetings and more characterized as just the normal social interactions that one might have within the hall. Uh, within the hallway during a normal meeting, uh, normal uh, workday. And then finally, I have a uh, message. We're doing video messages and things like this, which uh, I have a weekly message from the chair 
which again, the intent is just to maintain some cohesiveness, keep the employees up to date about new changes uh, and things that are going on. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to, um, to uh, uh, talk to you today about changes we've made in the Radiation Center for COVID. Uh, and I turn you back to Dr. Mesa, thanks. Well, wonderful, Dr. Bonin, and indeed some of their innovations as it relates to trying to leverage, you know, cars and parking lots and other things for social distancing. The broader UT health practice is exploring as we're trying to plan what the next phase of this looks like in, in ramping up uh, all aspects of care across UT Health San Antonio, but in the safest way possible. So we're really grateful for, for their innovative approach. Now, one crucial part that has continued during this era, but in a very uh, specific way, has been our ability to deliver cancer clinical trials. I'll ask Dr. Mahadevan to uh, update you a bit on those efforts. Thank you, Dr. Meza. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. please. Okay. Please Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> so I've been tasked with uh, talking about clinical trials for cancer. So the first question is why are cancer clinical trials important? As you can see from the diagram, we, we actually start with some discovery and preclinical work, which is still ongoing here. That hasn't stopped. Um, the do doctors and scientists are working very hard uh, to discover new targets and drugs. And any one of those drugs that enter clinical trials for the first time, uh, as we know, they're called first in human trials uh, and they're called phase one trials for, for that reason. Uh, many of the newer drugs, the uh, targeted therapy drugs and the immuno, immune checkpoint therapies are receiving FDA approvals you know, soon after phase one studies are completed. Uh, now, uh, more than ever before, which is amazing. So our patients get to uh, um, uh, be treated with these new drugs quicker than if they had to go through phase two and phase three trials, which is the traditional way of doing things. Uh, because they're active and mostly safe. Uh, so we have these trials open here and are enrolling really well. So uh, the next thing is that um, our faculty fellows, uh, nurses, uh, medical assistants, CTO staff are actively enrolling patients safely as um, discussed by Dr. Patterson and Dr. Wiles. They, they, they undergo all of that screening before they come into the center uh, and they all are masked and so they are taken care of in terms of their safety issues. So we have done every possible uh, way of uh, making these patients and staff safe. Uh, one example I'd like to highlight is that uh, we opened a phase one trial recently, which took us five business days. Normally these trials take a while to open because of various stages uh, of red tape. And this was a patient who was getting treated at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, but living in San Antonio, and we were able to get her here and treat her here. So that's that's really good news. Uh, we just want to let you know that we are also building a team uh, for phase one uh, uh, of doctors, nurses, uh, coordinators, and so on. And for the reason for that is that we recently was awarded a uh, National Cancer Institute uh, grant called the UM1 grant, which is a consortium of uh, um, you know, four institutions, including ourselves, MD Anderson, Austin, uh, Galveston. It's it's called a clinical trials network uh, for the for, for Texas, and so there are clinical trials available through the NCI that we can open here now, uh, which are which are really new trials for our patients. So that's also ongoing. Uh, the next question is, how does Mace Cancer Center help develop uh, new therapies? As I said earlier on, our doctors and scientists are working in the lab and in the clinic and are partnering with drug companies as we, as we speak and are developing investigate initiated treatments, uh, new drug combinations for many cancer types uh, and will be available for any cancer patients uh, here at San Antonio. Lastly, how do we keep uh, uh, patient staff and faculty safe with cancer trials during the time of COVID-19? I think that's been discussed quite a lot already just want to say that our clinical trial many of our clinical trial staff people are working from home uh, and they're doing it very successfully uh, we also have video visits as was already mentioned when appropriate and those patients who need to come in to get treatment are coming in and getting treated with proper safety equipment that's it thank you 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mahadevan. They say that that is a, a crucial piece. We are glad that we've been able to kind of continue to move that forward in a deliberate way, and we'll be continuing to, to ramp that up. Uh, indeed, these play a crucial and unique treatment option for many in the San Antonio area, so we're delighted to move those forward. So before we get to Q&A, and I know several of you have been putting them in, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. There's some great questions in there. Just a few updates on our center. So indeed, our center, as a reminder, uh, has been around since the 1970s. Uh, over 200 faculty and research members and many more uh, affiliated members. Uh, over 180 open clinical trials, over 1,500 patients go on to those trials per year. And now over almost 4,000 or more new cancer patients each year. We had our NCI site visit that you had heard about uh, earlier this year. We had it in February. That went very, very well. Uh, we received a, a wonderful score and very complimentary feedback and language from our reviewers from the NCI. We've not heard yet back formally on our renewal, but we expect that that will occur and that we've shown clear uh, progress and forward momentum from our prior renewal six years ago that will help to further fuel our efforts to become an NCI comprehensive cancer center for our next renewal cycle. Indeed, we have spent a lot of time on establishing our focus and our focus is cancer discovery around the issues in South Texas, developing the next generation of our cancer therapies, patient-centered complex cancer care, and advancing the science of cancer in Latinos. And throughout this year, and once we have live events, we'll be able to share more with you regarding how we're walking along our strategic plan. Indeed, we focus on our community and region. Uh, and we know that this community of almost 5 million people, 38 counties from here to the border, have both prevalent cancers and disproportionate cancer risk, including liver cancer. We've been focusing on developing a strong cancer control pipeline, both in prevention and screening, in supportive and survivorship care, and weaving that in both with our cancer care, but also with our primary care and many partners in San Antonio and South Texas. Indeed, we've been working on further expanding our footprint. Uh, in the South Texas Medical Center, our Clinical buildings are in orange, including the Mays Cancer Center building itself, but the care occurs across all of those venues and our laboratory facilities, as you see in blue. We're very excited to be actively planning after approval from the UT Board of Regents, our specialty research hospital that will have a strong focus in cancer. It will be directly connected to the Mays Cancer Center with a bridge have a tremendous impact in terms of our care capabilities as well as clinical trials. We've been deeply involved with research during this crisis and in particular, what does it mean for COVID positive cancer patients? Uh, we are part of a key group of COVID cancer consortium that is working to uh, pull together the information from across the country to learn as much as we can about this crisis how it affects cancer patients and how to keep them safe. Indeed, just showing a bit of that geographic distribution, but we're pleased that the Mays Cancer Center was one of the anchors of this important new group. So with that, I wish to transition over to our question and answer period. Let me uh, pull up here the, the question and answer stream. But first, let me ask a question of Dr. Patterson. Here is a, a common and a good question. How worried should we be about getting food from the grocery store or by food delivery? Can the virus be spread through food, through food? And if so, does cooking, boiling, or freezing help? Okay. So, um... Really, I don't think we need to be too worried about transmission through food that's prepared at uh, places like um, HEB and restaurants that have takeout. Um, they have to meet health code um, uh, stipulations, and so we can feel pretty good about that food. 
as far as uh, you know the the delivery, um, you may want to just discard the external packaging and then use hand hygiene. Uh, that's the safest thing to do. So, um, but, uh, you know, we feel pretty good about uh, deliveries. You just may want to be careful with the packaging, just discard it and use hand hygiene. Next question for Dr. Bonin. If I had cancer and radiation over 10 years ago, am I still at high risk? No, uh, you certainly wouldn't be high risk um, because of the radiation. Um, so, uh, in other words, you may have other reasons to be that you would be high risk in the high risk category, but but not because of the radiation. If I'm in remission, but I had lung cancer, am I more of a risk? Um, very similar to what Dr. Bonin was just saying about radiation. Um, it, it, no, no extra risk, but cancer is a comorbid condition, uh, just like diabetes or hypertension uh, or obesity. So yes, so if you're exposed to, uh, if you have exposure to COVID-19, then chances are actually uh, having a serious effect because you had active lung cancer is probably a little bit higher than if, if you were not. So also depends on the treatment as well. So let's say you're on an immunotherapy drug and you have pneumonitis, then the chances of uh, COVID infection uh, goes much higher up. Can't tell you exactly what percentage, but it'll be higher than the normal population. So it just depends on, the, on, on exactly where you are. If you, let's say you had lung cancer and it's, there is no evidence of lung cancer for a while, the chances are probably um, very similar to the normal population, unless you're, of course, exposed. And there are several questions. Maybe I'll try to answer them a bit together as it relates to where people stand with their specific treatment. You know, what I've been advising both for my patients, but other, uh, other kind of wide communications at this time is that it's a good time to connect with your hematologist or medical oncologist regarding you know, what your risks are during this time. You know, there are so many individual factors we really need to consider. Uh, your age, other medical problems that you've had, uh, the exact type of treatment that you are, are receiving or have received, as well as the impact of your blood counts, your immune response and others. So I do think it's a good time to, to connect with your, your providers, either with us or others. Uh, and that can be done uh, frequently now by either e-visits, phone, or others as is uh, relevant. Let me ask a question of Dr. Viles. Uh, I've heard many ways to protect against the virus when considered uh, an essential person that has to work. This question of people kind of slowly going back to work. What are the minimum requirements for working in an open office environment and having to leave the office to go to a conference room back to your own office? Should we be wearing masks or gloves? Let me get kind of your thoughts and then we'll ask Dr. Patterson for how those uh, recommendations are evolving as people slowly get back to work. Thank you, Dr. Messa. Uh, currently, the recommendations from, from the, the governor and the, the state of Texas and also the recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control is that any time that you're going to have current uh, physical interaction in, a, in an office type setting that we should be wearing masks, uh, both for our protection as individuals and to help prevent any, any possible transmission to other people. Uh, as Dr. Patterson mentioned earlier, we do still want to continue practicing good physical distancing uh, and, and not congregating in conference rooms at this time until this is all passed. So the, the other things that would be the, in line with what Dr. Patterson mentioned at the beginning, to have good and frequent hand hygiene and uh, to not touch your face and to continue practicing those, uh, those good habits that uh, we've all been hearing about from uh, our healthcare teams. Any additional thoughts, Dr. Patterson? I, I agree with all those uh, and I think you know in your own personal workspace if there are uh, surfaces handles or knobs that are you know used by other people or are shared with other people uh, you can disinfect those frequently as well and there I think there was a question about wearing gloves at work 
I think we can get kind of tricked about wearing gloves and thinking that we're protected all the time, but we can also touch our face uh, and uh, scratch our nose with the glove on too. So I think what's more important really is is where is uh, using frequent hand hygiene, either with hand washing or hand sanitizer, as well as using a mask. And maybe as a follow up question as it relates to the household, if a member of our household contracts the virus, how do we care for them while limiting our exposure without having an extra room for quarantine? Well, the ideal thing would be to have a separate bedroom and bathroom, uh, but if that's not possible, um, then uh, physically distancing as much as possible, using a mask um, and frequent hand hygiene, as well as the cleaning of uh, shared surfaces, surfaces that are touched a lot, uh, handles, knobs, um, and, and uh, cabinets and surfaces and so forth. Wonderful. Dr. Bonin, how susceptible are you after radiation treatments and should I quarantine after finishing radiation at this time? So I think that would depend upon a couple of things. Um, one is how soon after the uh, the radiation you're talking. So if it's been more than uh, six to eight weeks after the radiation, I think that uh, there's really no um, no issue. Uh, of course, it depends a little bit about the 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 uh, location of the treatment. Uh, one could think that if if you had your lung treated uh, and you had some fibrosis or some damage to the lung. Uh, that that because the the COVID is is um, seems to impact the respiratory system so dramatically, uh, that could make you slightly more susceptible. But but aside from that, uh, if you're more than six weeks out from radiation, uh, and there isn't an impact like a decrease in lung capacity due to your lung having been treated, I don't think that there's uh, you know a, a big uh, susceptibility related to other treatment sites uh, if you're more than six, eight weeks out. Uh, if you're in treatment, uh, then one reason to be extra careful about COVID uh, is so that you don't um, uh, interrupt your treatment, which can be very, uh, you know, very, uh, it can decrease the efficacy of the treatment. So, so to short answer, I don't think there's an issue if you're more than six, eight weeks out from radiation, uh, you know, so. Great, a question for Dr. Mahadevan. I'm due for a PET scan, but most hospitals are dismissing elective surgeries and procedures at this time. Does a PET scan fall into this category? Should I continue to get my scans during this time? That's a really good question, actually. Um, hard to answer that question completely uh, accurately. But um, if your provider thinks that you need a PET scan, uh, it's essential that actually you get that PET scan done. Uh, in terms of postponing uh, an operation, I don't think at our cancer center we are postponing any operations that are critical, uh, that are going to be critical to curing uh, cancer. I think my understanding is that those operations are continuing here. Dr. Mesa, maybe you want to, you want to give us a um, uh, further update on that. I, I would say you're exactly correct. You know, our goal from the beginning has been to you know, limit the, the exposure to the general public uh, for our cancer patients as much as possible, but not really uh, reduce or compromise the, the treatment that people are receiving. So important surgeries, uh, chemo or medical therapies, radiation are all uh, ongoing, as well as whatever imaging is really necessary for that to occur. Things that are more screening, long-term follow-up, uh, or kind of preventative, you know, let's use for the example, someone that chooses to have a, a preventative mastectomy because of a high family risk of breast cancer, things like that, we clearly will be deferring for, uh, for us to go past, the, uh, past this peak. Well, time is upon us. As we conclude, maybe I'll ask everyone just to make just a brief comment this has been a clearly an incredibly challenging time, but in many ways it's also been a time of tremendous scientific progress, of tremendous collaboration, of tremendous teamwork. Maybe everyone shared just one comment about something they found inspiring during this time. Uh, Dr. Mahadevan, why don't you start us off? 
Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Mesa. The most inspiring thing uh, actually was a patient on a clinical trial at India Anderson uh, wanting the treatment here in, in San Antonio. We were able to open that trial in five business days and get the patient in and treat them. That was amazing. An extraordinary team effort. Dr. Bonin. And you're, mute, you're muted, Dr. Bonin. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. So I think the most inspiring thing to me is the way that the team has come together and essentially transformed the way that we deliver care to make sure that we're there to support our patients and provide the best care they can get. I mean, it's been universal. And, and when one thinks about the, the, the vast amount of change that's happened in the cancer center in general over the last three weeks, four weeks, it's stunning. And what's so stunning is the way that our professional teams have come together and, and just just done what it takes. It's, it's just amazing. Fantastic. Dr. Viles. I, I would echo much of what, what Dr. Bonin said and, and Dr. Mahadevan for that matter. I think this has been a time where everyone has really gone above and beyond to, to work for the community, to work for our patients and to, to care for each other. Uh, the, the teamwork and the, the spirit and the morale of the Cancer Center, I think, is at an all-time high, particularly under such a, an extreme stressful environment out in our, in our physical world. But it, it's really not shown that type of impact here at the Cancer Center. Uh, everyone comes in every day with a smile and is really just going the extra mile to make everything happen for our patients. So it, it, it's really been inspirational to watch. Fantastic. Dr. Patterson, you've really been at the at the front lines of this from the very beginning. Uh, why don't you share us uh, what has struck you? Well, similar to what's been said, our ID team was really very gratified to get the remdesivir trial going for the COVID patients really within a matter of a few days, which considering all the regulatory hurdles uh, was amazing. And so we've been so glad we've been able to serve our patients that way. And then also, uh, again, similar to what's been said, seeing uh, everyone pull together as a team and seeing some of the remarkable things that people are doing and all of the processes that are working. Uh, together well. I'm, I'm very grateful for a lot of things to be grateful for. And perhaps I'll conclude by saying that I've been very inspired by the people of San Antonio. I, I've been now in San Antonio a little under three years and the unbelievable collaboration, the coordination across the city, uh, the very thoughtful leadership at the city and the county level, uh, our university leadership, I think it's done an extraordinary job both keeping the university moving forward, but also kind of preparing for this uh, crisis, as well as just the, the people of San Antonio, people lining up politely and, and adapting, whether they're at line at HEB or getting gas or other things. Uh, you really feel a sense of community, a uh, sense that people care for one another, and a sense that together we're going to get through this very difficult crisis. So let me thank you all for participating in today's webinar. We hope that this was helpful. I'm extraordinarily grateful for our team that helped to pull this together, as well as our wonderful panelists that have shared both of, of their time, talent, and energies uh, with us today. I hope all of you stay safe and stay well, and hopefully we'll be able to see you all in person sometime soon. Take care. <laughs>